This is Duke University. Um, I would start by saying that actually, you know, I'm, I'm working on this project called Duolingo, uh, which is about teaching people languages. We get about 100 emails a day of people asking for new languages. We, we, we don't cover every language. We only cover about five languages. We get 100 emails a day asking for new languages. And by far, the most common one is Esperanto. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. I don't know what to do with that. Uh, <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to talk about Duolingo mostly. But before that, I'm going to talk a little about some of the projects that I've done before. Uh, so let me first talk. In general, I work on an area that I call human computation. Uh, but it has gotten a, a different name uh, ever since around 2006 when somebody invented this word crowdsourcing. So I guess I now work on crowdsourcing. Um, so the first project that I worked on this area uh, was back in uh, the year 2001 slash 2002. It was a project called the ESP game. Um, it was a game. It was super fun. It turns out a total of about 10 million different people played it over time. Uh, now the thing about this game is it, it was really fun, but as people were playing it, the goal of the game was th there was a background goal, which was to get people to help us improve image search on the web. So here's the thing. Uh, you know, when you go to Google and search for things like, you know, you search for images, you can search for something like dog, and you get back a lot of images named, you know, for dogs. Uh, the way that works is because, because there's no computer program out there that can tell you whether an image contains a dog or not. The way that works is usually by using file names. So if you search for dog, you get back a lot of images that somebody named dog.jpg. The problem with that is that it doesn't always work very well because, for example, there's a very large fraction of images on the web called image1.jpg. So it doesn't work very well. <laughs> so so what, we, what, what I did was I made this game that people really like to play. And as people were playing the game, they were actually telling us the contents of images from the web. Okay, and the way the game works, it worked is it was a two-player game. So there were, it was an online game. You could go there. And whenever you went there, you got paired with another random player. It was just you and another random person. And the goal of the game is for both you and your partner, who is a total stranger, to type the exact same thing, given that the only thing you could see that you had in common was an image. So you can both see the same image. You know you can both see the same image. And now you're told, type whatever the other guy's typing. Turns out that what people did was just type a lot of words related to the one thing they had in common, which was the image. So this was, uh, and whenever the two of them typed, so basically, player one was typing some words related to the, to the image. Player two was typing some words related to the image. And then when they agreed, they got points. And then they got another image. That was how the game worked. Now, this word that the two players agreed on was usually a very good tag for the image, because it came from two relatively independent sources. And that, that was the idea of the game. This game was then acquired by Google. And they changed the name to Google Image Labeler and used to improve their image search engine. <laughs> So that was kind of the first project that I worked on this. That, that you see the idea of crowdsourcing there coming is basically a crowd of people helping to improve image search. Mm -hmm. OK, so that, that was a project that I worked on. Here's another one. Uh, how many of you have had to fill out some sort of web form where you've been asked to read this? OK, uh, these distorted characters. How many of you found it annoying? <laughs> good, good. OK, so I invented that. Uh, <laughs> So that thing is called a CAPTCHA. And the reason is there is to make sure that you, the entity filling out the form, are actually a human and not a computer program that was written to submit the form millions of times. And the reason it works is because humans uh, can read these distorted characters, not always, but sometimes, uh, whereas computer programs can't do it as well yet. So for example, in the case of Ticketmaster, uh, the reason you have to type these characters whenever you're buying tickets online is to prevent scalpers from writing a program that can buy millions of tickets two at a time. Okay. Now, CAPTCHAs are used all, of, all over the internet. And since they're used so often, a lot of times the precise sequence of random characters that are shown to the user is not so fortunate. So these were supposed to be randomly chosen characters. So let me show you. Um, this was a screenshot from something that was shown in Yahoo. This is in the Yahoo registration page. The random characters that happened to be shown in this CAPTCHA <coughs> were W-A-I-T, which of course spell a word, the word wait. Um, but the funny thing is the message that the Yahoo help this got about 20 minutes after this was shown. Okay, so the person thought they had to wait. Uh, this, of course, is not as bad as this poor person. Okay. Now, in general, a CAPTCHA is just a program that can tell whether its user is a human or a computer. Okay, let me say that another way. A CAPTCHA is a program that can generate and grade tests that most humans can pass, but current computer programs cannot. Okay, so notice the paradox here. CAPTCHA is a program that can generate and grade tests that it itself cannot pass. Okay, so in that way, CAPTCHAs are a lot like some professors. <laughs> we do that. Okay, now, the CAPTCHA that most of you have seen is this standard this squiggly characters. 
Uh, but it, it doesn't have to be squiggly characters. So the idea of a CAPTCHA is more general. It's just a program that can generate and great tests that humans can pass, but computers cannot. Let me show you some other examples of different CAPTCHAs, just because I think they're, they're pretty entertaining. Uh, so for the examples that I'm going to show you, you need to look at two things. It has to be the case that most humans can pass them, okay? like 99% of the human population can do it, and computer programs cannot. Okay, that, those are the two properties. So uh, the first one is a CAPTCHA that started appearing in Russian websites. Uh, we're going to call this the Russian CAPTCHA. Here it is. Uh, of course, this is actually a really bad CAPTCHA because computers can actually do this. Um, but it, 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 it's funny to see that in Russia, they think that 99% of the population can do this. Uh, so this is the Russian CAPTCHA. Let me show you one that started coming up in all kinds of blogs in India. Uh, we're going to call this the Indian CAPTCHA. You have to analyze the circuit. <laughs> Again, not a very good capture because, well, computers can actually do it. But again, it's funny to see that in India they think anybody can do this. Now, just to give you, just to give you a contrast, okay? In Russia, you have to solve a limit. Okay? In India, you have to analyze a circuit. Let me show you. This is a capture that started coming up in all kinds of U.S.-based blogs. We're going to call this the American capture. <laughs> I, I wish I was making this up, too. <laughs> OK, I could tell, of course, this is a pretty bad CAPTCHA because computers can add. Um, so you know, I could tell funny stories about CAPTCHA, but instead let me actually move on to another project that I worked on afterwards. It's a project called ReCAPTCHA, which started as a project inside Carnegie Mellon. Then we turned it into a startup company. Uh, and then uh, Google actually bought that company in 2009. So everything that I'm going to talk about for the next maybe five minutes is property of Google. Okay, so this. Uh, project recapture started from the following realization. At some point in around 2005-ish, um, I realized there's actually I did a little back of the envelope calculation about how many times how many captures are typed every day by people around the world. Turns out that number is about 200 million. So about 200 million times a day, somebody types a captcha around the world. Now the first time I realized this, I was quite proud of myself. I thought, look at the impact that my research has had. Uh, but then I started feeling bad because the thing is, each time you type one of these, you waste about 10 seconds of your time. And if you multiply that by 200 million, you get that humanity as a whole is wasting like 500,000 hours every day typing these annoying CAPTCHAs. So then I started feeling bad. Uh, and I started thinking, is the, of course, we can't just get rid of CAPTCHAs because the security of the web sort of depends on them. So I started thinking, is there any way in which we can use this effort for something that is good for humanity? So here's the thing. During those 10 seconds while you're typing a CAPTCHA, your brain is doing something amazing. Your brain is doing something that computers cannot yet do. So the question is, can we get you to do something useful? And the answer to that was yes, and this is what we did with reCAPTCHA. So nowadays, with reCAPTCHA, what you may not know is that while you're typing a CAPTCHA, not only are you authenticating yourself as a human, but also you're helping us to digitize books. Okay, and let me explain how that works. So there's a lot of projects out there trying to digitize books. Google, for example, has one. The goal is to digitize all books ever written. Okay, not only Google, Amazon has one to try to put all the books in the Kindle. And basically, the way it works is you take a, a physical book thing, like a You've seen those things, right? Like a thing. <laughs> okay, so you, you take a book, and then you scan it. Now, scanning a book is like taking a digital photograph of every page of the book. It gives you an image for every page of the book. The next step in the process is that the computer needs to be able to decipher all of the words in that image. That's done using a technology called OCR, for optical character recognition. It tries to take an image with words and figure out what, it, what they mean, or what they are. The problem is that for older books where the ink has faded, the computer cannot recognize a lot of the words. Because the, if, you have, if you ever photocopied an old book, you can see that it, the, you know, the words look pretty different. So, and for things that were written more than 50 years ago, for example, the computer cannot recognize about 30% of the words. So what we're doing now is we're taking all of the words that the computer cannot recognize, and we're getting people to read them for us while they type a CAPTCHA on the internet. Okay, so next time you type a CAPTCHA, these words that you're typing are actually words that are coming from a book that was digitized that the computer could not recognize. And the thing you're typing, we're using it to help digitize the book. Now, the reason there are two words instead of one is that nowadays, see, for one of the words is one word for which the system already knows the answer. That's the one that we use to figure out whether you're actually a human or not. The other word is a word for which the system doesn't know the answer. It just got out of a book. It doesn't know what it is. We don't tell you which one's which, and we say, please type both. And if you type the correct answer for the one for which the system already knew the answer, it assumes you're a human. And it also gets some confidence that you type the other word correctly. And if you repeat this process to like 10 different people and all of them agree on what the new word is, then one more word becomes digitized with very high accuracy. Okay, that's basically how this works. Now, it turns out this has been <coughs> extremely successful. Um, we've, to, to date, we are doing, so we're doing about 150 
million words a day. So we're helping to digitize about 150 million words a day through reCAPTCHA, all being done just one word at a time. And that's the equivalent uh, of about 2.5 million books a year, all being done one word at a time by just having people type CAPTCHAs on the internet, just transcribing them. Now, of course, since we're doing so many words, um, again, funny things can happen. And this is especially true because, see, now we're giving people two randomly chosen English words right next to each other. So funny things can happen. Uh, so for example, we showed this word, which is the word Christians. There's nothing wrong with it by itself. But if you put it along with another randomly chosen word, bad things can happen. So we showed this. <laughs> OK, that's pretty bad. Uh, but it's even worse because you see, well, reCAPTCHA is used in millions of websites. Uh, it turns out that the particular website where we show this actually happened to be called a web, it, it was a web website called the Embassy of the Kingdom of God. <laughs> Oops. Uh, here's another really bad one, um, johnedwards.com. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one that somebody just sent me about. It really was about a, three weeks or a month ago. It was pretty funny. This is the Romney website. <laughs> <laughs> so we keep on insulting people left and right. Of course, there's not much we can do, because for one of the words, we don't know what it actually is. So there's not much we can do to really prevent this. Um, but OK, it's not just, so we keep on insulting people left and right, but it's not just insults. Um, it's also just interesting stuff. And this has actually given rise to a whole new internet phenomenon uh, in which literally tens of thousands of people have participated in it's something called CAPTCHA art. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't seen this, let me explain. So the idea is the following. Imagine you're surfing the internet and suddenly you see a CAPTCHA that you think is interesting, like this one, for example. Okay, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to take a screenshot of this. Then, you're, of course, you're supposed to type the capture because you help us digitize books. Uh, but then afterwards, you're supposed to draw something that is related to this. So like this. Okay. <laughs> this is an example of capture art. There are literally hundreds of thousands of these. Um, and some of them, like this one, are cute. Uh, some of them are funnier, like this one. <laughs> And some other ones, like paleontological schwizzle, they contain Snoop Dogg. Okay. So that's CAPTCHA art. But of course, this is the web. It doesn't end there. Okay. Some other CAPTCHAs, like this one, Inglip Summoned, have actually created entire religions. <laughs> Let me explain. Um, so what happened is, this CAPTCHA was shown to somebody. And I guess, according to the Gospel of Inglip, uh, the next capture that was shown to them, so th you know, they, they thought of creating a religion. The, their lord is called Lord Inglip. That's the god of this religion. The next capture that was shown to this prophet uh, was a capture that said this, called Gropagas. So they called themselves, the followers of this religion, Gropagas. <laughs> okay? And the idea of the whole religion is that Lord Inglip communicates with his followers through CAPTCHAs. <laughs> That's the idea of the religion. Now, when we heard about this, uh, we thought this was hilarious. So we started messing with them. So we started, <laughs> we started just showing them CAPTCHAs with actions, like this. <laughs> or this one. <laughs> just started messing with them. It was pretty funny. Uh, now, the crazy thing about this religion is that it has at least, for example, in, in Reddit, it has at least close to 10,000 followers. <laughs> okay, so 10,000 followers of this religion. And now I feel good about this because that's more than the number of people who follow Harold Camping. If you don't know who Harold Camping is, that's the guy who last year in the summer predicted that the world would end. He had less than 10,000 followers. So I feel good about this. And here's another, <laughs> here's another piece of capture art that I found on the web. <laughs> okay, now. This is my favorite number of the reCAPTCHA project. This is the total number, 950 million. This is the total number of distinct people that have ever helped us digitize at least one word out of a book through reCAPTCHA. Now, it is numbers like these that motivate my work. Okay? And in particular, the question that motivates my work is the following. If you look at humanity's large scale achievements, these really big things that humanity has done, the, the mega projects, the historical mega projects that humanity has worked on, like the pyramids of Egypt, or the Panama Canal, or putting a man on the moon, these big, big things that humanity has done. There's a curious fact about them. And it is that all of them were done with about the same number of people. All of them were done with about 100,000 people. 
And the reason for that is because before the internet, coordinating more than 100,000 people was impossible. Okay, but see, now with the internet, I've just shown you a project where we've gotten close to a billion people collaborating with each other to digitize human knowledge. So the question is, if we can put a man on the moon with 100,000, what can we do with 100 million? Okay, now based on this question, I started a bunch of different projects. Uh, the majority of them have failed. But uh, let me tell you about one project that I've been working on for the last maybe two and a half years, which is the, the main topic of this talk. It's a project called Duolingo. I'm very excited about it. Uh, and this project started with the following question. The question was this. How do we get 100 million people translating the web into every major language for free? Okay, let me, there's a lot of things to say about this question. First of all, translating the web. So right now, the web is partitioned into multiple languages. More than 50% of it is written in English. And if you don't know English, you can't access it. There's also parts in Spanish, parts in German, etc. If you don't know those languages, you can't access it. So I would like to translate all of the web into every major language. That's what I want to do. Now, when we started working on this, we thought, well, why can't we use computers? For example, there's machine translation. Why can't we use machine translation to translate the web? Uh, the reason for that is because it's just not very good. Uh, it makes a lot of mistakes. For example, you would not see a book being translated by machine translation and be sold somewhere. It's just not very good for that. Now, just to show you, um, here's actually something that was machine translated that we found on a forum about Java. Okay, this is a forum about Java. I'm going to show you something that was translated from Japanese into English. Okay, and I'm just going to let you read it. So, at first, this person just start up, starts apologizing by the fact that this was translated using a computer. Uh, now remember, this is supposed. This is this was supposed to be a question in a forum about Java programming. Okay, the here's the preamble to the question. Okay, here's the first part of the question. Here's my favorite part of the question. <laughs> And here's my favorite part of the whole message. <laughs> OK, so machine translation, not yet good enough, so we need people. Now, of course, if we need people to translate the web, we can't do it with 100 people or 1,000 people. We literally need millions of people helping us to translate the web. And if we need millions of people to do it, I can't quite pay them all, because that would require a lot of money. So the question is, how do we get 100 million people translating the web into every major language for free? That was how we started. Now, when we started on this question, we actually got stuck pretty quickly uh, with two pretty major obstacles. The first one is a lack of bilinguals. I don't, the, the fraction of the world's population that is bilingual is quite small. And if I need to get 100 million of them, that's really hard. So that was a problem. The second problem was a lack of motivation. How am I going to motivate people to translate the web for free? This is something that you normally have to pay people to do, quite a bit of money. So the question is, how am I going to motivate people to do it for free? Now, we were stuck on this for a few months until we actually realized there's a way to solve both of these problems with the same solution. There's a way to kill two birds with one stone here. And it is by transforming language translation into something that millions of people want to do, and that also helps with the problem of lack of bilinguals, and that is language education. Okay, so it turns out that today, there are about 1.2 billion people around the world learning a foreign language. Okay, people really want to learn a foreign language, and it's not just because they're being forced to do so in school. For example, in the US alone, there's over 5 million people who paid over $500 for software to learn a foreign language. People really want to learn a foreign language. So the idea with Duolingo is the following. N number one, we need a boatload of language translation, point one. Point two, there's over a billion people learning a new language all over the world. Some of the exercises that people do when they're learning a new language are translating things. So the idea with Duolingo is why can't we get these people who are learning a new language to translate it for us for free? That's the idea with Duolingo. And so that's what we've been working on. So in June, June 19th of this year, we launched Duolingo, which is a website where the idea with Duolingo is it's a website that you go there. And if you go there, you can learn a language 100% for free. But at the same time as you're learning, you're also helping us to translate the web. Okay, so you learn by doing. Some of the things that, some of the exercises that you get are helping to translate. Okay, let me play you this uh, two minute video that explains the concept of Duolingo a little better than I can. It's a big world out there. Billions of us trying to live, love, prosper, and make sense of our brief time on this planet. Since the dawn of humanity, we've been passing information from one person to another through a common language. Unfortunately, you can't communicate with others without knowing or learning their language first. A similar issue is manifested on the web, where text can be penned in dozens of languages, each of which demands a reader's fluency. 
We've developed an elegant solution to both problems, a way for you to learn a language for free, while at the same time helping to translate text from the web, enabling a wealth of language-shackled information to be liberated for all of humanity. It's called Duolingo. Here's how it works. Let's say you're a native English speaker who wants to learn Spanish. We start by giving you a sentence from a Spanish website and asking you to translate it. Wait, back up. How can you translate a language you don't know? First, Duolingo only gives you sentences that fit your language level. Beginners get the really simple sentences from the web, and advanced users get the more complex ones. This way, everybody becomes a valuable translator. And second, if you're really lost, you can always see possible translations for words you don't know. Afterwards, Duolingo helps you understand and memorize the words you hovered over through educational examples. You can also vote on the quality of other students' translations, which helps you learn by seeing how others translated the same sentence. And because you create valuable translations while you learn, we return the favor by offering Duolingo completely free of charge. No ads, no hidden fees, no subscriptions, just free. To put the potential benefit of Duolingo into perspective, think about this. If one million people would use Duolingo to learn, the entirety of English Wikipedia could be translated to Spanish in just 80 hours. Duolingo, learn a language while translating the web. OK, so that's the basic idea. Uh, and now, when we started working on this, I actually didn't really think this was going to work. Uh, I thought this was kind of too crazy to work. Uh, but over time, I've started to become more and more convinced that it will work. Um, and over the last three or four months since we launched it, I'm now certain that it's going to work because it is actually working. So people really are liking it to learn a language. And also, the translations that we're getting are really good. Now, in terms of uh, learning a language, how good is it to, to learn a language? Um, on actually, really soon after we launched, um, PC Magazine made us their editor's choice for language learning and gave us the same rating as Rosetta Stone, um, except, of course, we're 100% free, whereas Rosetta Stone costs between $500 and $1,000. Now, the most ama amazing thing about this, to me at least, was that PC Magazine is still in business, or that's still around. <laughs> and, of course, people say some pretty good things about Duolingo. Um, so, for example, this person said in the past two days, I've learned more from Duolingo than Rosetta Stone in over a month of use. Here's this other person, who was my mother. <laughs> uh, and here's this other person, uh, who just some, some people are a little creepy, uh, like this one, <laughs> said this. OK, so people really like Duolingo, uh, which is good. Uh, and one of the reasons they like it is because they can learn a language with real world content. So as opposed to just learning a language with these silly sentences that are like, the girl runs, the girl runs fast, the blonde girl runs fast, you can, you can learn with real world content. So imagine learning English by reading the latest edition of the New York Times and helping to translate that. It's a really good feeling about that. So, so that's one of the reasons why people like it. Now, in terms of the translation, so people like it, people learn a language, that's good. But the most um, for me, the most amazing thing is that the translations that we're getting are extremely accurate. And in fact, they are as accurate as those from professional language translators. Okay, now, just to show you one example, here on top is a Duolingo translation of a sentence from German into English. And the bottom is a professional translation of somebody that we pay 20 cents a word to do. And if you can see, the quality is comparable. Okay, it's in fact the same quality. Much, much, much better than computer translation. Now, of course, we play a trick here. And the trick is that each each translation in Duolingo is done by multiple users. And then they themselves vote on which one the best one is. And then we pick the best one. But of course, you know, that best one actually happens to be as good as a translation from a single professional translator. OK, so the translations are really good. Um, let me explain this graph. This is a graph that, let, let me explain. This is, this is what's called cohort analysis. So I'm going to show you. So this graph is all the people who sign up to Duolingo in the first week of March. Uh, this is before we launched. We were doing a private beta. This is all the people that signed up in the first week of March. That was 100% of the people. Then this first point here, week one, that is the number of people that came back in the one week period, one week after they signed up. So in day 7 to 14, what percentage came back? Turns out that number was about 27%. Okay. Then week two, that's the number of people that came back in the one week period, two weeks afterwards. So days 14 to 21, something around 19% came back of that original number. And then 
If you go out and stretch it, you see it, this one actually stabilizes at around 15%. Okay, so of the people who sign up, 15% became weekly actives. Okay, now, normally, you know, when I'm talking to academic audiences, uh, this, this graph actually seems pretty crappy. Okay, so it says, OK, if only 15% of the people who sign up actually stick with it. Uh, but it turns out this is actually a really good number in terms of, for example, the number of people who become weekly active users of Twitter is around 20%. So, but now, so this is uh, the, the cohort of the first week of March. This is the people that signed up in the first week of April. So it does a little better. So a little more become uh, weekly actives. And this is the cohort that signed up in the first week of May. And this one stabilizes a, l a tiny bit under 20%. So it's about 19.5%. So, and by now, we've beat 20%. So we're at around 21% of the people who sign up become weekly active users of Duolingo, and it lasts kind of forever. Okay? Now, the question is, how have, we, you know, how have we improved this? How have we made this better? And the way we've made it better is by basically just running all kinds of different versions of the website and always picking the best one. So we're running A-B tests on everything that we do. So for example, here's one of the things that actually did the most. We, I, I mentioned that we have this model of every user about what they know. So we know every word that you know, at least through the site, and all the concepts that you know. We, we've had this model forever. But then at some point, we started exposing it to the user. We started showing them what we think you know. It's kind of your vocabulary. It turns out that was what one of those big increases was, just showing your vocabulary. That really helped. Um, here's another one that really helped. For some of the things that you enter, we already know the answer. And we are able to tell you whether you got it right or wrong. Okay, we've always done that. But what the improvement that we did is we now started telling you why you got it wrong if you got it wrong. Uh, so for example, we may tell you, oh, you have a typo in your answer. OK, that's not a big deal. But we may tell you more insightful stuff. So for example, for this person, we told them, in the accusative case, this is in German, by the way, in the accusative case, you use einen for masculine nouns like apfel. So we started telling them really clear reasons for why they were wrong. And it turns out that also helped us improve retention quite a bit. Uh, we can't always do this. This requires quite a bit of technology to do this. So we can't always do this. But we have a good measurement about how often we can do this. It turns out about 15% of the time that you get something wrong, I can tell you exactly why you got it wrong. The other 85%, we can't. The, I would say the most common thing that people, so we get, we get about three to 5,000 emails per day of people ask, you know, sending feedback of any form, either saying something's broken or asking for features or asking for new languages, et cetera. The most common thing after asking for new languages. So the most common is asking for new languages. That's the most common. The second most common is telling us is there, it, 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 they all say something to this effect. I use Duolingo at work, but I don't have headphones. And I don't want it to make noise because you know, there's my coworkers. So can I turn off the audio component? Can I turn that off? That's basically the feedback that we get. And it is very common. We must get, I don't know, like 100 of these per day, uh, a lot of them. Um, so we thought, OK. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, in the corner, in the top corner of the screen, we're going to put a little icon in there where you can turn off the audio. And that's going to make us majorly increase in traffic because all these people who are at work trying to use Duolingo are now going to be able to use it. That's what we thought. We put it up there, and it actually turns out that retention dropped. And the reason for that was because, you know, we were quite puzzled. Um, but then we started kind of figuring it out. And it turns out the reason is that when you turn off your audio, we, we, what we do is we turn off all the listening exercises and speaking exercises. We turn all of that off. Turns out, learning a language without that is much crappier. It just turns out. So what was going on is people were turning off the audio because they were at work. Then they were never bothering to turn it on. And now Duolingo seemed like a much lamer website. And then they didn't come back. So of course, we now turn that off. And now you basically, you can't quite turn off your audio. You can, but you have to find it in really hidden someplace. Uh, so, and that, that, that's, what, that's what we ended up doing. Uh, here's another thing that I, is pretty interesting. This is our usage by country. Um, actually, it has changed. This, is, this, this slide is about uh, a month old. It has changed because, OK, I'll tell you how it has changed. But it's about, about a quarter of our users come from the US. Uh, and then we have a whole slew of other countries. The reason I mention this is because it turns out, by the way, it has changed. And the way it has changed is now Brazil is the number two country. And it's because we launched learning from Portuguese. And ever since, somehow everything becomes popular in Brazil. It's like the new Japan. 
Everything's popular in Japan now, and everything is popular in Brazil. So Brazil is now the number two country. Uh, it has uh, about 15% uh, of our users come from Brazil now. Um, now, the th interesting thing about this is that if you look at retention, this curve in the US, it's the same in the US, in the UK, in Canada, identical curve. It is significantly lower than if you look at that curve in Mexico. In Mexico, and it's, by Mexico I mean any, any of the developing countries here, the curve is much higher. It's, about, it's, it's a whole about 5 or 6% higher, the whole thing, than if you look at it in the developed countries. Uh, and the reason for that is because in the case of at least learning a language, see learning a language in the US, for example, is, it's a hobby. It's like, hey, wouldn't it be great to learn some French? That's how it is. Whereas if you look at it, let's say Spain or Mexico, learning a language is done so that you can get ahead in life. And it's not just learning a language, it's learning English. That's what they're doing. They're all learning English, and they're way more into it than people from the US. And by the US, I mean UK, Canada, whatever. Pick, pick your choice there. Um, so for us, in particular, actually, users from, say, Mexico are much more interesting than users from the US because they will actually stick to it much more than people from the US. Uh, so, um, so that's that. Uh, the other thing is the US fraction, even though our number of users in the US is growing, the fraction of US is getting smaller for us. Um, I, my guess is that's going to, at the end of the day, that's going to be close to about 10%. This is my guess. Um, OK, now, this also segues into this, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm really excited about this, um, in particular. Uh, for, for this particular type of education, which is language education. Uh, I'm not going to say this is true for all types of education, but for language education, there's this funny thing. Right now, the business model for language education is, or the most common one, is the student pays. Okay, and if you want to do it over a computer, the model, at least in the US, is the student pays Rosetta Stone 500 bucks. That's kind of the business model. Now, the problem with that model is that for those who don't have 500 bucks, they just can't afford it. And the majority of the language learning needs are actually outside of the US in developing countries where they just don't have 500 bucks. See, but in this business model for language education, which is Duolingo, the student doesn't pay. It's 100% free. But the reason it's free is because we're, you know, they're kind of paying, but they're paying with their time. But it is time, you know, it's time that's spent translating. But it's time that would have been spent anyways learning. Okay, so something comes out of nothing. Is something magical coming here? Uh, and it is, you know, it's it's much better because now uh, you just have to pay with your time, and it's, it's much better for for people who don't have you know, 500 bucks. So I'm very excited about that particular thing. Um, so that's all I have. If you want to learn a language and help translate the web, duolingo.com. Thank you. <laughs>